Good morning, church. You may not know this, but I have faults. <laughs> One of my faults is I, I critique music. And it's like, well, can you write anything better? And the answer is no. You realize goodness is, an, is a noun. Your goodness is not running. Yeah, it, that's an idiom. It, Good, God's goodness can't run after you. That would like, be like saying, your omniscience runs after me. No. What it means is that our God who is good comes after you. Okay? So it's an idiom. Just so you understand. Never mind. I'm glad you're here. Welcome to Faith Community Church. We're going to go back to our Genesis study. It's called The Beginnings. If you have a Bible, I'd like you to turn uh, to Genesis chapter 6. If you don't have a Bible, there's one in the seat in front of you. And go to the first book of the Bible, which is Genesis, to page 4, and you'll find Genesis 6. So far, we've looked... uh, In chapters 1 through 5, we've covered the creation account in chapters 1 and 2, the fall of man and the consequences because of their sin in chapter 3, the first murder of one brother against another brother, Cain murdering Abel in chapter 4, and we see how Adam's family, Adam and Eve's family, begins to split into two different lines, Cain's line in chapter 4 and then Seth's line in chapter 5. And four weeks ago, we looked at the names of 10 men in a genealogy list from Adam to Noah. Anybody want to tell me the 10 names? Well, Adam starts it. And then Seth, Enosh, Kenan, Mahalalel, Jared, Enoch, Methuselah, Lamech, and Noah. And four weeks ago, we looked at the man Enoch and how he was different from everybody else. It tells us in verse 54 that he walked with God. And he was not, for God took him. So chapter 5 ends with Noah, who's 500 years old, and he has three sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. And Noah becomes a central character for the next four chapters. Chapters 6, 7, 8, and 9. But today we're going to only look at the first 14 verses of chapter 6. It's an introduction to the flood account. It explains why God destroyed the earth with a flood. So let's read a little bit. In verse 1 of chapter 6. Now it came about when men began to multiply on the face of the land, and daughters were born to them, that the sons of God saw that the daughters of men were beautiful, and they took wives for themselves, whomever they chose. Then the Lord said, My spirit shall not strive with man forever, because he also is flesh. Nevertheless, his days shall be 120 years. The Nephilim were on the earth in those days, and also afterward, when the sons of God came in to the daughters of men, and they bore children to them. Those were the mighty men who were of old, men of renown. (laughs) All right, what are we to make of this? (laughs) Let's let's pray first. Lord, we do come before you, and we're going to look at, well, a cryptic passage, verses 1 through 4, and... We need help, so may the Holy Spirit of God open our eyes, open our minds, and help us to uh, think through the issues of this, these four verses. And uh, most of all, when we get to the other verses, may your point really come clear. In Christ's name I pray this. Amen. I titled this message, The First of the Nephilim. 
because it appears in verse 4. Most commentators call this the most debated text in Genesis. <laughs> These four verses. And some of you are going to sleep for 20 minutes and then wake up and get to the real meat of this passage. Who are these sons of God in verses 2 and 4? Well, that's the debate. Derek Kidner calls this a cryptic passage. Victor Hamilton says, suffice it to say, it is impossible to be dogmatic, to be authoritarian about the identification of the sons of God. So right off the bat, I'm not saying this, what I'm going to tell you is the right view. I don't think we can know the right view until we get to glory. But let's look at four different views regarding the sons of God. Verse 2, the sons of God saw that the daughters of men were beautiful, and they took wives for themselves, whomever they chose. Who are these sons of God? Well, the earliest of all views says it's angels. Angels are called the sons of God in Job chapter 1, verse 6, where it says, Now there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan also came among them. Same kind of verse in chapter 2 of Job, verse 1, says the same thing. In fact, the early, one of the early translations of the Hebrew into Greek called the Septuagint actually says angels of God instead of sons of God. So what's the sin? The sin is sexual union of fallen angels with human women. And their offspring were the Nephilim in verse 4. If you have a King James Version, it doesn't even say Nephilim. It says the word giants. Where do they get that from? Well, Nephilim is also in one other passage of Scripture, and that's in Numbers chapter 13, verse 33. When the spies who went out to spy the land came back to tell Moses... This is the spies' report in Numbers 13, 33. There also, there also, we saw the Nephilim, the sons of Anak are part of the Nephilim, and we came, became like grasshoppers in our own sight, and so we were in their sight. So here are Nephilim who are very tall, sons of Anak, who were living in the land of Canaan. And the spies come back and say, I don't think we can beat these guys. So the sin of sexual union of fallen angels with human women is so great that according to this view, they're kept in eternal bondage awaiting judgment. They get this from the passage in Jude, which is one chapter, verse 6, where it says, and angels who did not keep their own domain, but abandon their proper abode, he, meaning God, has kept in eternal bonds under darkness for the judgment of the great day. So linking that passage with Genesis 6, verse 2, they say it's angels having sex with women. 2 Peter chapter 2, verses 4 and 5 says, For if God did not spare angels when they sinned, but cast them into hell, committed them to pits of darkness reserved for judgment... And did not spare the ancient world, but preserved Noah, a preacher of righteousness, with seven others when he brought a flood upon the world of the ungodly. So here in two verses, it's linking Noah and the flood with these angels. And so therefore, it ties into Genesis 6, verse 2. That's their view. The problem with this view, in my eyes, are this is too mythical, <laughs> Marriages between the gods and humans, they're well known in Greek philosophy and their pantheon and Egyptian and Ugaritic and Hurrian and Mesopotamian theology. But if it's in biblical theology, well, this is the only place. In fact, this is the first mention of angels in the scriptures, if this is the case. Secondly, angels don't marry. They're sexless. In Matthew chapter 22, 
Jesus is being asked by the Sadducees about this illustration of a man who's got a wife. The man dies and his brother marries her. He dies and his brother marries her. And seven brothers all had her and they all die. And the Sadducees say, okay, in the resurrection, whose wife will she be? By the way, they don't even believe in the resurrection, but that's beside the point. Whose wife will she be? And in verse 29, Jesus answered and said to them, You are mistaken, not understanding the Scriptures nor the power of God. And here's verse 30. For in the resurrection they neither marry nor are given in marriage, but are like angels in heaven. (laughs) That speaks against this view, right? Angels don't marry. So there's another similar view to this view of the angels about these fallen angels. This is by Kent Hughes. He was a pastor and theologian and he wrote, uh, these fallen angels, well, they can't have sex, but they can possess mankind who then can have sex. So it's really a spirit inhabiting a male body taking possession of it in order to have sex. That's how he gets around the angel itself not having sex. That's one view. Second view is that the sons of God referred to the Seth line. The lineage of the people who come from Seth. They're the godly ones and they are intermarrying with the ungodly Cain line. The Cainite line. So the sin here would be forbidden union between what's a believer, a follower of God, and an unbeliever. This one also has problems. See, if Seth's line is the godly line, then why is Noah the only one found righteous? When we get down a little bit later in this chapter. Also, if you look at verse 1... It came about when men, this is the word Adam in Hebrew, began to multiply, meaning it came about when humans began to multiply on the face of the land and daughters were born to them, to man, just normal marriage. Then you have in verse 2 that the sons of God saw that the daughters of men, same word men, but now this men doesn't refer to all men, it refers only to the Cain line. That just doesn't make too much sense. Plus, when the sons of God saw, if the the Canaanite line saw that the daughters of men were beautiful, meaning the the Seth line, well, it makes you wonder if the Cain line didn't have any beautiful women. And why use the phrase daughters of men only to refer to one line? Well, this theory comes from Augustine in his book, City of God. By the way, that's Warren Wiersbe's view, but this one. So let's go to the third view. This is the royalty view. The sons of God means royalty, dynastic rulers. And these rulers, these kings, took the best of the daughters of men because of their beauty. And also probably because of their physical stature. And they brought them into a harem. And so the sin is a little bit like what Lamech did by having polygamy. Polygamy. And it says in the ancient Near Eastern texts that the kings in the ancient Near East were construed as being sons of deity. And you can read all about this in the Gilgamesh epic. Anybody want to read that in the Gilgamesh? No. Okay. (laughs) Anyway, Gilgamesh was two-thirds human, I mean two-thirds God and one-third human. How that happened, I don't know. But Gilgamesh also had the horrendous sin of calling the The rite of the first night, whenever somebody got engaged to be married and they married, then as the 
monarch in place, the ruler in place, he had the right to have sex with the wife before the, the bridegroom does. If you ever watched Braveheart, you can, it, it's in that movie too. Okay, royalty. This is the view of John Walton. It's got its problems. And there's one more view. See, these three views all see Genesis, 1, Genesis 6, 1 through 4 as an introduction to the flood. But John Salehammer in the Expositor's Bible Commentary sees verses 1 through 4 as a summary to chapter 5, like an epilogue. In other words, you have the genealogy and then an epilogue. If you go over to chapter 10, there's another genealogy listed here. And then there's a summary, there's an epilogue, verses 31 and 32. These are the sons of Shem according to their families, according to their languages, by their lands, according to their nations. These are the families of the sons of Noah according to their genealogies, by their nations. And out of these nations were separated on the earth after the flood. And then in chapter 11 you have another genealogy of the line of Shem, verse 10 and following. And in verse 27 to the end of the chapter, now these are the records of the generations of Terah. Terah became the father of Abraham, Abram, Nahor, Haran, and Haran became the father of Lot. Haran died in the presence of his father Terah. So after the genealogy, then you get this summary or this epilogue for the rest of the chapter. So what John Salehammer says in his commentary is we should see verses 1 through 4 not really belonging to chapter 6 and following, but really an addition to chapter 5. And don't forget, verses and chapter divisions were added much later. The Hebrew text just keeps running on. So that's his view. So therefore, he says the sons of God just means men. As man's origin is from God, okay, created from the dust of the ground, a man was breathed into him the breath of life. God breathed into him the breath of God. While the woman's origin is really from the side of man. So it's just looking at the origin. So man or men are really, well, their origin was God. And woman's origin is really from man. And that's why the difference. According to Salehammer, there's nothing sinister or out of the ordinary in verses 1 through 4. It's just marriage. And he looks at the New Testament in Matthew 24, verses 37 to 39, where Jesus is talking about his return. And he says, for the coming of the Son of Man will be just like the days of Noah. For as in those days before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage until the day that Noah entered the ark. And they did not understand until the flood came and took them all away. So will the coming of the Son of Man be. So we're just talking about marriage here. Well, what do you do about verses 3 and 4 then? Well, that text has its own problems. <laughs> Verse 3, the Lord said, My spirit shall not strive with man forever, because he also is flesh. Nevertheless, his days shall be 120 years. Well, the word strive is the word, well, contend, and it's only used once in all of Scripture. So that throws it into suspect right away. Septuagint has remain. The Lord said, my spirit shall not remain with man forever. Big difference, right? Contending and remaining. I kind of go with the Septuagint on this one, will not remain because it actually goes on to say his lifespan will be 120 years. And the word spirit can also be the word breath. Ruach can be breath, wind, or spirit. So the text could easily say, my breath will not remain in man any longer after 120 years. God who gives life because he gives the breath of life. And when you get to the end of the Pentateuch, and Moses wrote Genesis through Deuteronomy, when you get to Moses, he dies full of health, but at the age of 120. 
By the way, anyone know who the oldest living man was? Just died. This man right here. Juan Vicente Perez Mora. He's died at the age of 114, just two months before what would have been his 115th birthday. He credited his longevity to working hard, resting on the holidays, going to bed early, drinking a glass of aguardiente every day. I assume that's a glass of wine. Loving God and always carrying God in his heart. And he just died. People don't live to be past 120 anymore. Actually, they don't even get to 120. My spirit will not remain a man forever. This is a limit to man's life is going to be 120. You get to verse 4. The Nephilim were on the earth in those days. John Walton in his commentary... He says there's three ways to identify the Nephilim. One is using the meaning of the term, Nephilim, the etymology. See, the root of this word is NPL, which means to fall. So either it means these are the fallen ones, or these are the ones who fall on others. We're not sure, meaning that they're strong enough that they can be, well, powerful warriors who fall on others and kill them. So he says the etymology doesn't help too much. Secondly, we can identify who these are through their association. And that's the Numbers 13 passage. They're associated with the sons of Anak, men of great size. That's why the King James uses that word giants. So we identify them as giants. Anybody know who the tallest man in America was? I think we got a picture of him. You know where he lived? Alton, Illinois. He grew to be 8 feet 11 inches tall. He was called the gentle giant. He only lived to be 22 years old. That's his father, by the way. He got an infection when he has a leg brace because of his height that irritated his his ankle, and a blood infection uh, set in, and he died at the age of 22. Robert. His name is Robert Wadlow. Men of great size, sons of Anak. Then the third way is to identify through general context. And in both passages, Numbers passage and Genesis passage, we have the Nephilim appear to be renowned warrior heroes. So the Nephilim are probably not a race of people, because if they were a race of people, how did they survive the flood? They had to have been on the boat somehow. The ark. So they're probably not a race of people. The word most likely is a descriptive term meaning mighty men or great men of physical stature or great men of renown. There, is that clear? (laughs) If I had to pick a view, but I would not die for this view, I would just say it's a toss-up between number three and four. Okay, that was a long introduction. Now let's get to the heart of the text. (laughs) Look at verse 5. Then the Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great on the earth, and that every intent of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. And the Lord was sorry that he had made man on the earth, and he was grieved in his heart. The Lord said, I will blot out man whom I have created from the face of the land, from man to animals to creeping things and to the birds of the sky, for I am sorry that I have made them. But Noah found favor in the eyes of the Lord. 
These are the records of the generations of Noah. Noah was a righteous man, blameless in his time. Noah walked with God. Noah became the father of three sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. Now the earth was corrupt in the sight of God, and the earth was filled with violence. God looked on the earth, and behold, it was corrupt, for all flesh had corrupted their way upon the earth. That God said, excuse me, God said to Noah, the end of all flesh has come upon me, for the earth is filled with violence because of them. And behold, I am about to destroy them with the earth. Make for yourself an ark of gopher wood. You shall make the ark with rooms and shall cover it inside and outside with pitch. Let me tell you that Noah, at the right time, was the right man to do the right task. He was living at the right time because he was the right man to do the right task. And we can see right away that Noah lived during a time of great depravity. Depravity. In verses 5 through 7, we can see that the Lord saw the pinnacle of his creation, which is man, deteriorate or degenerate. The Lord saw mankind. If you see the word man there, that's not the normal Hebrew word ish. It's the word adam, meaning human. He saw the wickedness of humans was great on the earth. Great. Wickedness, ra, could be evil. He goes on to expound on that every intent. That word could be purpose, too. Every intent or purpose of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. Continually is really all the day. Meaning, they were all the time, they were thinking only of doing evil. And the greatest of all evil is to exclude God from life. Self-rule, not God rule, but self-rule. If you look down at verse 11, you can see it tells us twice, verse 11 and verse 12, that the earth was corrupt. We're not told the ways in which it was corrupt, but it was corrupt. And in verse 11 and in verse 13, it says the earth was filled with violence. And again, we're not told what kind of violence. We assume that life is cheap. Taking of life and injuring life is commonplace. And I think of the world we live in, and we say, do we live in a corrupt world? Is our world filled with violence? And we're getting to that place where every intent and thoughts of the heart is on evil continually. We're going to learn that God said he would never destroy the earth by water again, but will he destroy this earth? Yeah, read Second Peter. The earth is going to be destroyed by intense heat. The Lord saw mankind. Their wickedness was great. And it tells us in verse 6, the Lord regretted or was sorry he made mankind. I think regret is the better word. He regretted it. It says he was grieved in his heart. This grievance in his heart is not so much emotional pain, but more of the fact that he was grieved by being offended. Insulted how his creation had deteriorated in the course of time. The New English translation actually says highly offended instead of grieved. And so the Lord determined to destroy this corrupt world. That's verse 7. 
The Lord said, I will blot out. Some translations have, I will wipe out man whom I have created from the face of the land. But he's not just wiping out man. Look what it says. From man to animals, to creeping things, and to birds of the sky. And you go back to chapter 1, and those are some categories you see in the day 4 and 5. Animals, creeping things, birds, and man in day 6. And he repeats, I'm sorry, I regretted that I have made them. And verse 13, because the earth is filled with corruption and violence, he says at the end of verse 13, I am about to destroy them with the earth. The Lord's determined to destroy the world as they knew it. But yet Noah stood apart from the corrupt world Right in the midst of what God's going to do, you have the section in 8 and 9 about Noah. He found favor in the eyes of the Lord. So on the one hand, the contrast is the Lord saw the wickedness of mankind, but he also saw this one man, this human named Noah. And he found favor Of all the men in the world, Noah was different. And the Lord, Yahweh, saw it. And as our world becomes increasingly wicked and corrupt, I wonder if God's looking down and sees us as being different. Remember, the eyes of the Lord search to and fro throughout the whole world to truly support those whose hearts are fully His. Does God see me as being different from the world? Because I got to tell you, I think I'm getting desensitized to some of the evils of this world. I find myself tolerating things I would not have tolerated before. Noah, he found favor. He differed from the culture in which he lived. It tells us in verse 9, Noah was a righteous man. Some translations have the word just. In other words, he lived right. In God's eyes. Secondly, it says he was a blameless man in his time, in his generation. The word blameless there can mean the word complete or being sound, having integrity. Some versions have perfect, but that gives you the wrong idea thinking that he never sinned. No, he wasn't perfect that way. He was sound. He was a man of integrity. In Genesis 17, 1, blameless is linked to walking before the Lord. Abraham, or Abram, was 99 years old. The Lord appeared to Abram and said to him, I am God Almighty. Walk before me and be blameless. See, blameless is linked to walking before the Lord, meaning having a proper relationship with him. In Deuteronomy chapter 18, verses 13 and 14, Moses wrote what the Lord says, you shall be blameless before the Lord your God. For those nations which you shall dispossess, listen to those who practice witchcraft and to diviners. But as for you, the Lord your God has not allowed you to do so. In other words, you to be blameless, it's the Lord. You don't follow after things of the occult. How 
have the proper relationship with God. He's righteous, he's blameless, and he was a man who walked with God. Who else walked with God? Do you remember? Enoch. Go back a chapter to verse 22. It says, Enoch walked with God. In verse 24, Enoch walked with God. Twice it says about him, and he was not, for God took him. Noah is the great grandfather, I mean grandson of Enoch. Remember back it said in chapter 4 verse 26 when it talked about the birth of Enoch that men began to call on the name of the Lord. Walking with God implies having an intimate relationship with God, one in which there is worship and communion. We would call him a man of faith. Are you one who walks with God? Are you a man or woman of faith? Do you stand out in this world that we live in? And although the text doesn't come right out and say it, it makes you wonder of worshiping the Lord, was it passed down from Enoch to Methuselah to Lamech to Noah? You can do the math. You can find out that Lamech died five years before the flood came. And Methuselah died in the year of the flood. They died before the flood. Otherwise, they probably would have been in the boat. Walking with God, having an intimate relationship with God. And so in verse 14, we see that the Lord appointed Noah to build an ark for saving life. The ark was the instrument or the means by which life was saved. Noah is in the faith chapter of Hebrews 11. In verse 7, it says this, By faith Noah, being warned by God about things not yet seen, meaning he's going to send a flood, in reverence, meaning he had reverent fear or godly fear, he prepared an ark for the salvation of his household, by which he condemned the world and became an heir of righteousness, because, which is according to faith. He was a man of faith. By the way, was the ark big enough to have other people join it? Yep. Remember I read that verse? He was a preacher of righteousness. The whole time he's building this ark, over 100 years of building this ark, he's a preacher of righteousness. He's warning people of judgment that's going to come, and who joins him in the ark outside of his family? No one. That's how corrupt the world was. Well, I'm not going to cover this point because this, that would be the sermon for next week. So parents, I can't stress how important it is to pass on the faith. Provide opportunities for your children to be exposed to the teaching of God's word. Expose them to prayer. Expose them to worshiping together with other people of like-minded faith. How do you do this? Well, Read Bible stories to them when they're young. Romans 10, 17, faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of Christ or the word of God. Parents, encourage your children to attend our children's ministry or if they're teens, the youth ministry. There's an idea going around in this world. Hey, I'm just going to let my child decide for themselves whether they want to go. Guess what? They won't want to go. You want to know why? Because those little children, I don't want to call them demons, but they are (laughs) young people of the flesh. And young people of the flesh do not gravitate to the things of God until they've been converted and the Holy Spirit comes within them. Expose them to the things of the Lord. If you have young adult children or old adult children, encourage them to go to church. 
where they can be exposed to fellowship, to worship, to prayer, and to the things of God's word. Parents and grandparents, when you have your family over, how important is prayer in your family? Do you even say a prayer before the meals? Well, I know my son doesn't really worship the Lord. Pray with your family. But men and women, most of all, You need to model for your children what a man or a woman of faith looks like. You need to be a model of it. Your family needs to see that you're a passionate follower of Jesus Christ. That God's word means something to you. Prayer means something to you. Coming together to worship means something great to you. You can say the right things, but if you're not modeling it, you have really zero impact on your children. I believe Enoch passed the faith on to Methuselah, who passed it to Lamech, who passed it to Noah. Are you going to pass it? So I want to close with the encouragement. Let's be a church of Christ followers who, like Noah, stand apart from the corrupt, wicked culture of our day, and we will be noticed not only by God, but by others, especially our families. Amen? Amen. And I say amen as well. Father, we do come before you, and I thank you for this man, Noah a righteous man, a just man, different from his community, from the culture in which he lived, blameless, a man of integrity. But most of all, he was a man who walked with God, having an intimate relationship with the Lord, with Yahweh. Lord, help us to be men and women who are righteous, blameless, and who walk also with God. Walk by the Spirit, and you're not going to give in to the deeds of the flesh. You walk by the Spirit, and you exhibit the fruit of the Spirit. Lord, our culture is wicked. corrupt and violent. I pray that we as a church of Christ followers that we would stand out in our culture. That not only will you notice but may the culture notice and want what we have. Which is Jesus. So, Lord God, you're calling us to pass the faith on. If we've been negligent in doing so, it's never too late to repent, meaning to change our direction and start to pass the faith on. And perhaps our family and community won't like it. In Noah's day, judgment came and destroyed all mankind. But the next time you let judgment fall, it's not just killing the body, it's killing body and soul in hell. May each one of us see the imperative, the importance of passing on what we believe to the next generation who will then pass it on. This we ask not to do in our own power, but through the power of the Spirit. This we ask in Jesus' name, amen.